What is up, y'all? Kevin Kuhn here from Athlete Factors. This is the Athlete Factors podcast. My guest today is Jay Uterman. How we doing, sir? Uh, thank you. Yeah, I'm doing good. Awesome. Awesome. So you are uh, originally from Germany, but currently in Scotland, correct? Uh, that is correct. Yeah, I'm located in, in Edinburgh. So basically, I've done my master's in England while my partner was uh, pursuing her, her master's and PhD in, in Scotland. And um, yeah, just kind of liked it here, stuck around, and I moved up to Scotland, basically. Very cool. So uh, first and foremost, you are a performance nutritionist, which is pretty cool, pretty awesome title. Wish I had that as, as my title. Um, so, yeah, but I, I like what I'm doing. Can't complain, really. Excellent. Well, please tell us a little bit uh, about your... Uh, personal background, athletics, academics, uh, work experience, things like that. Sure. Um, so I suppose best way to start off and sort of describe um, my route into uh, sports science and, and sports nutrition uh, is really my background as an athlete. So basically, as a teenager, uh, I played numerous sports, um, the main one probably being uh, Olympic handball, which is uh, not very well known or famous in the U.S., uh, sort of, uh, I don't know, a, a mixture of uh, rugby and lacrosse, maybe. I don't know how else to, to explain it for, for the folks in the States who don't know handball. Just type it into YouTube. Um, so I played that at a quite a high level. Um, and then during, I also played tennis, uh, tried football for a while as well. So not American football, soccer. Um, mm -hmm. And I um, also I've done uh, wrestling in the States for a year. So during an exchange year, uh, I tried wrestling like that quite a bit. So um, I uh, transferred when I got back to Germany. I basically started MMA doing that for two years, roughly. Um, and I've also um, ambitiously uh, I didn't compete, but I, I was doing it quite seriously, um, natural bodybuilding and sort of power, powerlifting a mixture. And mm -hmm. then um, last not but not least, I've also um, done a few uh, local CrossFit competitions um, and uh, recently picked up uh, climbing as well. So basically, I've done uh, many, many done sports. Um, yeah, yeah, really, really enjoyed it. And then um, obviously, I wanted to pursue a profession that is linked to, to sports. And because of uh, various injuries that I um, experienced quite early, um, I decided that I don't want to to, to become a, a coach or a strength and conditioning coach just because I was afraid my, my body wouldn't hold up um, showing those exercises to clients and uh, decided to pursue a nutrition career. Um, and so that started off with um, the goal in mind to become a performance nutritionist. Um, and uh, so I started my or did my bachelor's in Germany um, in nutritional sciences, and then um, right after I basically topped that up with uh, a postgraduate diploma from the Olympic Committee, which was um, mm -hmm. online. So um, that was that course is taught by Louis Berg and Ron Morgan, so two very well renowned researchers in sports nutrition. Um, and then uh, I hadn't hadn't had enough from academics yet and uh, uh, did another complete master's program in England, um, completely in, in sport and exercise nutrition. Very cool. So um, for most people who, who may not, I guess, understand the differences between, uh, I guess, the basics of sport nutrition and performance nutrition, how would you differentiate there? Um, I wouldn't say it, it's, it's too much of, of a difference, really. Uh, it's just different phrasing of uh, the, the same meaning, I suppose. Mm. Um, for me, performance nutrition um, captures multiple areas of trying to support an athlete or trying to support an athlete's performance. Um, and that includes, um, obviously, uh, fueling, recovery, um, training adaptations, but also indirectly, like the immune system, for example, mm. uh, body composition that can mm -hmm. all transfer to the the athlete's performance. Really, um, it, it's definitely much more than just uh, protein or taking a few supplements. Um, so it, it's quite a 
a broad area and if you go into um more or if you look up more details of it it's um yeah it's 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 quite interesting how many things and how many different nutritional aspects can can influence um, an athlete's performance gotcha yeah that's that's one of the things like especially looking at uh some of your posts where it's the things you're talking about are a little more whole holistic from the standpoint of um as you mentioned, you're looking at, at immune function. You're looking at uh, uh, like the gut microbiome, and and you're looking at all the aspects that af uh, affect. Uh, um, losing my my uh, words right now, but I'm reminded of that post that you put up where it's looking at uh, not so much the the differences between calories in, calories out, but uh, the differences between uh, how we calculate your caloric expenditure and how it's related to not just your exercise activity thermogenesis, but your non-exercise activity and the other things that are related to that. So um, I just appreciate that it's much more holistic than, as you said, just uh, more protein and that's all the athlete needs. Like mm, perhaps when it comes to and maybe I'll get in trouble for saying this, but perhaps when it comes to more of the physique or the figure athlete, you can focus a little bit more on those things. But when it comes to athletic performance, I think it is extremely important to shift focus to all of those branches that can affect an athlete, both in training, but sometimes more importantly, in competition. So I think that's yeah. awesome, man. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, so yeah, uh, on the one side, I suppose the theoretical framework of nutrition can be can be quite complicated, um, and like you said, I'm, I'm taking that example from my Instagram post, the sort of calorie in, calorie out equation. If you look at that in more detail, it, it's far more complex than just on the one side the calories th that you consume versus the calories that you burn, right? Mm -hmm. So um, both sides of the equation are being influenced by so 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 many factors: genetics, uh, environment, uh, sleep, um, etc. Um, and that sort of principle holds true to, to very many aspects um, of, of nutrition. Um, I suppose the good news is that um, when you try to translate these theoretical findings into uh, real world um, foods and, and, and nutritional strategies, it then becomes much less complicated. So that's where um, I, I try to communicate in a very different manner with my athletes than to, uh, I suppose, the majority of my Instagram followers, because many of my Instagram followers are uh, coaches like you who, who just follow me because they, they want to further educate themselves. Whereas mm -hmm. an athlete, um, in my experience, most of them, ju they just want to know what they what they have to eat, what they're supposed to put on their plate, right? So mm -hmm. you have to you have to be uh, able to translate these complex theoretical frameworks into easy to follow and implement uh, implementable strategies for, for an athlete, really. Mm -hmm. I hear you. I think that's so true. Yeah, knowing knowing your audience is extremely important when you're trying to get a message across, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, so true, yeah. sir. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about uh, what you were studying and researching for your master's degree, because that's, uh, that's a, a specific topic that, um, at least within the last five to 10 years has, uh, the specific ingredient has become somewhat controversial. And so hopefully you can clear the, clear the air for us with regards to that, but I don't want to, I don't want to spoiler, spoiler alert anything. I'll let you, I'll let you have the, uh, the pleasure. Um, yeah, I'll do my very best. Um, so I did my master's thesis, uh, I think it was back 20, end of 2016. Um, and uh, during that time, I was, I was still doing CrossFit. Um, and I, I wanted my research to be linked to high intensity exercise in general. Um, and during that time, there was a study published by a researcher called Wilson et al. Uh, it was just, I think, one year old. Um, and, and he's reported, I mean, extraordinary results um, after taking the supplement HMB. Um, and HMB is basically just a, 
uh, a metabolite of the essential amino acid leucine. Uh, I, I go, um, I explain in a minute why there, there might be a rationale for supplementing HMB, even if it's metabolized from, from leucine. Um, so, so basically, in that study, what Wilson and his colleagues found or reported, um, let me put it that way, um, after 12 weeks of um, intense res uh, resistance training, uh, advanced athletes or uh, um, people who were going into the gym uh, for, for a few years and um, had very decent strength numbers. I, I can't recall exactly, but it was definitely uh, dub double body weight, um, squatting, um, mm. I think bench pressing 1.3 times your body weight in kilograms. So definitely um, strong Pretty dudes. Advanced. Yeah. yeah. Um, and they were apparently able to, to gain uh, 12 kilograms of lean mass during uh, three months of, of uh, resistance training. Um, and I mean, first of all, lean mass isn't just muscle mass, so um, it does include um, water as well. So it might have just been, I don't know, let's say nine to 10 kilograms muscle mass. But even that is just, um, it's extraordinary. And it, it basically is, is nowhere found in, in the sports science anywhere. Uh, mm -hmm. other than when people were given steroids, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, uh, obviously, uh, these results were just mind-blowing and everyone was just uh, shaking their head and, and, and it was just too good to be true, really. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, um, my master thesis focused on, the, focused on that supplement and what I basically did. So originally, I wanted to run my own study, which uh, unfortunately didn't work out because of uh, logistics, but um, I did a what's called a systematic review. Um, so for those who aren't into science too much, basically it's just um, a, um, a systematic evaluation and assessment of studies that um, fulfill a certain search criteria, right? Um, so before identifying studies that uh, fulfill your criteria, you have to define um, the, the quality, sort of the, the methods of the studies that you want to assess. And um, what's actually interesting is that there, back in 2016, there were quite a few studies about HMB available, but most of them had very, very poor um, methodology. Mm -hmm. um, so in the end, I only included three studies in, in my overall assessment. One of these studies was the Wilson the Wilson study, and, mm -hmm. and, and basically to, to wrap things up. Um, the other two studies didn't find any positive findings. Um, and, and the Wilson study, just e extraordinary results, like I said before. So mm -hmm. um, I, I maybe I, I, should, I should add that um, for my thesis, um, all the studies had to be done in advanced athletes. And I'll, I'll go into why why that does make it or might make a difference. I'll explain that in a second. Um, but going back to the Wilson study, so because it was so mind blowing results, um, it was it was such great news that the study was replicated um, just a few years ago uh, by um, uh, Stuart Phillips Labs. Um, I think mm -hmm. the first author was Texera. And basically, what they've done is they they completely replicated the methodology with um, one exception, and that was actually a feature that was so good that they changed that. Um, because in most HMB studies, what they are doing is they're just comparing HMB to a placebo, so basically taking nothing, right? Mm. And mm -hmm. um, I mean, even if you're not a protein expert, you can sort of imagine, okay, if you're after intense training, you take some form of amino acid or amino acid met metabolite, or you mm -hmm. take nothing. OK, so that it, it's not really surprising that you see some sort of benefit when you take like uh, some sort of amino acid after training. Mm -hmm. um, but I suppose the better question to ask is, is there an added benefit when you compare H and B to a complete um, protein source like uh, whey, mm -hmm. for example? Right. Because mm -hmm. obviously whey has a high leucine content and mm -hmm. it does have uh, contain other essential amino acids um, which are not included in the HMB formula. So how does that, you know, um, stack up? Um, and they could not find any positive effect of HMB whatsoever. So 
neither on hormones like testosterone, growth hormone, um, inflammatory markers like um, IL-6, um, can't remember the others they measured, um, they couldn't find any effect on muscle damage markers like uh, creatine kinase, mm -hmm. uh, and they, they couldn't find any difference in terms of actual mus muscle growth, which you know, is obviously the most important finding. Um, so, um, wow. because the, the, the observations were so largely contrasting, Mm -hmm. um, the, the entire research community was basically just saying, okay, the first paper must have been uh, sort of, you know, the data must have been made up or at least uh, <laughs> rigged or something because uh, it just yeah. wouldn't make any sense. And um, right. I mean, there is uh, an official commentary of, I don't know, I think 20 renowned protein researchers basically writing to the scientific journal that the, the findings of the Wilson paper, they just don't add up. Don't add up. Um, and as far as I know, correct me if I'm wrong, um, he's also, um, Jacob Wilson is, is no longer uh, working at a university. Um, I don't believe so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, I guess we can, we can all speculate why, why that is the case, but <laughs> um, yeah, r rumors are that he, he wasn't working at uh, the highest uh, ethical standards um, that are required in research, basically. Okay. But putting the, the Wilson paper aside and, and, and basically debunking that HMB is, um, you know, the magic pill for, for athletes and, and resistance training. Mm -hmm. And there are quite a few of interesting um, studies that have, have looked into HMB. Uh, and maybe taking one step back and, and explaining what the rationale behind HMB is and what the mechanisms are, and then I can sort of wrap things up. Um, mm -hmm. What I believe is the, the overall evidence um, about HMB and um, in, in what scenarios it might make sense to take take the supplement or um, eventually not. So, um, like I said, HMB is um, met metabolized from, from from leucine. And so, what's important to know here is that the conversion rate is only around five percent. So, five percent um, of whatever leucine you take in is converted to HMB. Um, and in order to have or to get an an effective dose from HMB. Um, you might have to consume roughly around 60 grams of leucine, which is a f uh, like far above 500 grams of protein. So that's <laughs> almost damn impossible to do, right? Unless yeah. you are um, just, I don't know, on a, on a protein, protein um, shake diet. Um, <laughs> so it, it, it theoretically at least makes sense to top up with HMB um, in order to get the effective dose. Um, and what is that supposed to, to do in the body? So basically, um, because leucine is metabolized in the muscle cell and not in the liver, like many other um, amino acids, it has been hypothesized that not leucine itself, but one of its metabolites is actually responsible for triggering the muscle protein synthesis response. Um, and there is some mechanistical research that where they blocked certain conversions from one metabolite to the other that, that did, does support that um, uh, hypothesis. Um, but as far as I'm aware that it's, it's only in vitro studies and not really um, human studies. And then if you look um, into to further research, basically um, what is mainly reported is that um, HMB is, is rather anti-catabolic than anabolic, right? Mm -hmm. So leucine is basically supposed to initiate the muscle protein synthesis, whereas HMB actually, um, it lowers the muscle protein breakdown. So the other side of the equation. Mm -hmm. And that is supposed to translate into uh, reduced uh, muscle damage. Uh, and then this is basically what, what HMB got famous for, right? So the rationale is, okay, when you take HMB, it lowers your muscle damage, so you're getting less sore, um, and therefore you can uh, you can tolerate a higher training volume, higher training intensity, and that um, basically results in um, enhanced uh, performance and mus muscle growth uh, and so forth. Um, a few issues with that. So first of all, um, muscle damage is, is quite tricky to measure in the lab, actually. Um, so they're usually measuring what's uh, creatine kinase, basically an enzyme that's involved in muscle repair. Um, so an indirect me measure of, of, of muscle damage, and it's not supposed to be like super accurate. Um, 
for example, it, it's it's highly influenced by the, the time of the day that you take the blood. Um, it's also you would have to withdraw from uh, or the, the, the time difference from your last training session um, to actually the blood testing makes a big difference. And it's not all standardized across the studies, so you, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's hard to compare. Um, and overall, it's, it's very, the findings are very mixed, basically, right? So a few studies could find improved CK values. Uh, so let, let's uh, say it, it, it does translate or it, it's a good marker for muscle damage. Uh, for um, a few studies did find improved um, CK values, but many didn't. Um, so it, it's very mixed results. And the one of the hypotheses uh, was basically that in order for HMB to be effective, um, the participants or the athletes, they have to undergo like a brutal training program, right? So unless the, the training stimulus is very, very high, then HMB wouldn't be effective. And it, it kind of makes sense when you look at the mechanistics of how the supplement is supposed to work. And then also if you take into consideration the, um, the re different results between beginners and advanced athletes. So overall, HMB has been shown to be more effective in beginners, which are more prone to muscle damage and soreness than advanced athletes. Um, so that's sort of a, maybe an, an overview of how HMB is supposed to work. And, and, and um, maybe to, to wrap things up, um, the, like I said, the, the overall evidence is very mixed in terms of, of, of its efficiency. Um, so I wouldn't go as far and, and say it's like complete bogus. Yeah, there are definitely mm -hmm. some some studies that, um, other than the Wilson studies, that that did find significant um, and, and meaningful results that could translate to improved performance. Um, but it's by no far the majority. Um, gotcha. So for me, it falls sort of in the category to, yeah, kind of nice to have supplement. Um, and um, in my experience, um, so I've tried it with a few athletes, like both with beginners and, and advanced athletes. Mm -hmm. um, it, it does work better with uh, sort of the athlete that um, is having a suboptimal protein intake mm -hmm. um, and is maybe not so advanced, for example, an athlete that just tra transitioned from endurance sports to CrossFit and, and he's just really suffering from uh, delayed muscle onset soreness, okay? Yeah, um, just so, not, not used to that type of stimulus at all. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. So that's where personally as a coach, I, I, I did observe some, some benefits. Mm -hmm. um, but with, for example, um, I've worked with uh, a few high level CrossFit athletes, um, they, they didn't notice the difference at all. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's where the, um, obviously the rationale is, okay, these athletes, they, they can push themselves quite hard, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if, if we don't see any benefit there, then in what other scenario is it supposed to work? Um, so yeah, that's um, basically my my take on, on HMB. Um, it's still probably uh, studies uh, published on HMB regularly. Um, but if you look at them, most of them are really poorly controlled. Again, we have that placebo HMB issue. And then in many studies, they don't control for the diet um, or don't even report protein intake. It's, it's ridiculous, right? So yeah. um, they just basically tell the participants, okay, don't change your diet and then take, take <laughs> HMB. And then, okay, what, what is your, your overall lifestyle? What is your diet? Okay, um, if, if that's like really poor, then maybe that supplement does have uh, a positive effect. But if mm -hmm. of your lifestyle and diet is, 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 is really good, um, then in my opinion, h and will do very little to nothing to improve your performance uh, nor body composition. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, it, it all comes back to the whole idea of supplementing. Like, that's supposed to fill in, a supplement is supposed to fill in a gap. So if you're if you're getting enough protein, then you're probably getting optimal amounts of leucine. If you're getting enough leucine, then you're probably ingesting enough HMB. So, um, or it's metabolized into HMB. One of the one of the claims that when when HMB when the Wilson study had come out and and like everybody wanted to get their hands on it, one of the claims that was spreading like wildfire was uh, similar to what you'd mentioned, like. The harder you work, the more volume you accumulate, the better it works, which, you know, like at the time, 
I was in a position where I wasn't really questioning a lot of things coming out of the lab at, at University of Tampa because I, I was like, these guys are amazing. You know, like at the time, he was – Jacob Wilson was doing a podcast with Lane Norton and that thing was amazing. I learned a ton from it. Like all – he was he was like the – one of the guys in the industry who was, you know, doing all of this research with uh, – who was it? Ben Pakulski, I believe, who was like a, an amazing bodybuilder probably the best in the world at the time and he's got him in his lab you know and so we get to we get to see this kind of behind the scenes um perspective about what it's like having someone of that caliber you know doing all of this stuff so it was kind of one of those things where um you know i i just kind of took the claims at face value i was like oh my goodness hmb is going to change the game and, you know, at the time I was like dealing primarily with endurance athletes. I was like, oh my goodness, these Ironman athletes, they need this. This is like all they're doing is training volume. That's it. There's very little intensity. It's just accumulate miles. They need this. And then, you know, it wasn't too long after that where people were like, you know what? I'd, I'd like to, you know, try to replicate that study or... You know, the other difference was I think very few studies had used or I don't think any other studies had used the specific type type of HMB that they were yeah, studying the free specifically. Acid yeah. The free acid, right? So everybody I, I think had access to the powdered form, but the, the liquid form uh was was the one that everybody wanted and, and couldn't get their hands on at the time. So so interesting, man. I think there's I'm glad that you provide the nuance where, you know, like, you know, like creatine monohydrate. Some people say that they're, they notice a difference and some people don't. And, you know, it's so cheap and it's kind of one of those things. Like if you're taking, you know, three to five grams a day, like it's not going to hurt you. You might as well take it. And even if you don't feel a difference, you're probably doing yourself a favor. If you can afford to take a HMB and you notice a difference, yeah, why not? I mean, why that, not go that, for that's it? that's a very good um, um, uh, thing that you basically just said there, right? I mean, uh, it, it, when it comes to supplements, it's in the end, it's a, a risk benefit analysis that, analysis that should be done, right? Um, mm. And then with HMB, there are literally none, like no side effects whatsoever, no gastrointestinal problems. Uh, uh, nothing serious with the organs, nothing. Um, so if you have a high caliber athlete that is suffering with like ongoing muscle soreness, there's no harm in, in, in trying it out. Um, mm -hmm. But you shouldn't try it with uh, the idea of, okay, when I take that, I'm going to put on 10 kilograms of muscle mass, right? So that claim is just ridiculous. <laughs> um, and then even before the the studies were replicated, uh, replicated I mean, um, uh, people were, were scratching the head where how, how this was possible. I mean, in my thesis, um, I did a comparison of um, uh, the Wilson study with a, a, another study where they actually injected um, the, the, the athletes with, with testosterone. Mm. Like, so they were actually, the, I think it was back in the, in the 90s. Um, I don't know how that passed ethics, but apparently the study <laughs> happened. And so they were... <laughs> They were basically hitting the gym like multiple times a week, uh, like going uh, like a, a brutal tra training regimen, just like the Wilson study. Um, mm. And 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 H and B basically outperformed testosterone injections. I mean, that's how wow. ridiculous the the, the twelve kilograms of lean body mass are, um, and and that just puts it in perspective, right? Yeah, that's absolutely insane. Everybody thought like, Oh my goodness, this is, this is the thing. This is the next big, big yeah. thing. We don't need, we don't need steroids anymore. Like this is it. And yeah. everybody can have access to it. And then mm, maybe not. Maybe. Yeah. And then, I mean, you mentioned the, uh, your endurance athletes as well. I mean, there, there is uh, a few studies with endurance athletes, um, mm. that have been published. And one was uh, in the early 2000s, I believe. And they actually did before I uh, did, um, uh, report uh, a performance benefit mm -hmm. and then that's by all like just because of one study um, all the endurance athletes that I know um, they started taking HMB 
<laughs> as, as ridiculous what one study can do, right? Um, uh -huh. And then I'm, I'm, you know, so much of a science fan and supporting science, but um, that's not what it's supposed to do, um, right? So when you try to to inform your athletes based on the overall evidence, you need to, to take into consideration um, all studies that, you know, um, that, that, that are important to that, to that topic um, and not just cherry pick one study just yeah. because it fits your narrative, right? Right, yeah. Uh, it, it can be difficult and it can be confusing, especially for, for those who either don't know how to read a study or who don't care about anything except the, uh, you know, like the abstract. Like, what's what's the bottom line? Like, I don't want to read the study, right? I don't want to read all the studies. I don't want to balance all the evidence. I just want to know yes or no. Does it yeah. work? And it doesn't. Like, it, it's a shit lot of work to be honest. Like, I was <laughs> I was spending hours in the library screening studies. Like, you don't even know how much time it takes to do like a systematic review. So that alone tells you. Like, I was reading. Uh, over a thousand titles, screening way over a hundred abstracts, uh, and then reading like what sixty studies from start to bottom, right? Wow. Um, so it, it's a lot of work, and that's just one supplement. So obviously, as a coach, as an educator, you want to be able to um, inform your athletes um, over a variety of different as nutritional aspects and supplements. So mm -hmm. um, they're always like you know you, you can't be an expert in any, in everything. It's just not possible. So um, that's why, you know, podcasts like yours and, and other evidence-based um, information that's put out there is, is so vital um, because science is trendy and sexy, um, which is cool. But mm -hmm. um, it, it also means that many people who aren't educated to interpret research or um, I don't want to even say they, they do that on purpose. But like you said, it's, it's tricky and difficult to, to come to the right con conclusion and, and interpreting research. Mm -hmm. And related to that, there's there's times where people who are uh, not only well intentioned but well educated and and experienced in the world, you know, that disagree on what on what they think. You know, like there's absolutely there's that as well, which can be you know very interesting. But yeah, um, well that's that's a good little primer for anybody who's interested in HMB and thanks for catching us up on that. So let's, let's transition away from that a little bit. So tell us a little bit about, you know, your job as, as a performance nutritionist and, and kind of, uh, what's, what's the basics, I guess, of your general philosophy when it comes to nutrition for athletes, as far as, uh, what do athletes need? Uh, it's such a great question, Kevin, you know, and um, the reality is it's 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 really tricky to answer that question with one or two senses, um, because in in my opinion, um, the nutritional needs and requirements vary hugely, just not just from person to person, but also from the sport that you do. Right. Mm -hmm. And then um, probably even more important is what does your current diet look like? So what is the baseline that you bring to a nutrition, a nutrition coach. So I've had athletes that um, they are just so genetically gifted and um, they were basically able to outrun the bad, bad diet, even though it's quite tricky, right? So mm -hmm. um, it, it, it really needs a, a thorough assessment of, of what your holes in your diet are in order to decide what is the, the best starting point to make changes. Um, so maybe just to give you an, an, an example. Um, so I've had one client that he was just eating um, of or brain. I had so many things figured out. Like he was um, eating high quality. So he was a, a sort of regional level uh, CrossFit athlete. Okay, um, he was um, eating high high carbohydrate intake, which at that time was um, not a given for a CrossFit athlete because the paleo diet sort of was still promoted by CrossFit HQ. Um, mm -hmm. He was spreading out his protein uh, evenly. He was consuming enough protein. He was eating healthy fats, plenty of veggie. So all the basics you would check, right? So you would tick that box. Um, for him, the biggest struggle was 
more of a, a practical manner, right? So he was he was traveling traveling a lot, sort of like sponsorship things, and then also mm-hmm. with um, like he was a, a coach at PT himself and was working at, at different gyms. So it was more of a, an issue to 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 help him get the calories in that he needed, and to come up with easy to prepare meals that he could you know. Um, that he could prepare or on, on the go basically pick up anywhere to sort of hit his uh, nutritional um, requirements. Mm-hmm. Um, so sometimes it's more a practical issue where in theory, what he, it, the theory of, of the requirements isn't that tricky or complicated. He was just eating a few hundred calories um, below what he was probably needing and mm-hmm. his body fat was, was pretty low, um, which is great for a physique athlete, but when you're like, 10% or lower for crusted athletes, that basically means you're not consuming enough calories, your strength is suffering, and then potentially mm-hmm. your calories, et cetera, as well. Um, so that's basically just uh, one common example where it's, it's very easy. Um, another example can be the, the complete opposite. So if I, I had a, a few female clients where um, it was the complete opposite. So they were basically obsessed with healthy eating and performance nutrition isn't, isn't just vegetables and micronutrients and vitamins, etc. cetera. It's, it's mm-hmm. far more complex as we um, discussed at the beginning. And mm-hmm. um, what I've experienced is that um, they were basically not getting enough from, from everything. <laughs> and mm-hmm. They were eating healthy, but if you only consume like 17 1800 calories and you're training every single day and a lot of your 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 calories come from salad and tomatoes um yeah they micronutrient rich but it's 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 not enough still yeah right? there's no gas in the tank yeah and it's still like b vitamins uh fiber um especially uh, females they have a, a higher iron requirement because of the period um, and then also um, the, the iron uh, metabolism is, is sort of influenced by endurance exercise as well. So that might ramp up the, the requirement as well. Um, and then basically that led to malnutrition overall. So um, in that case, because there were so many, so many things that I wanted to improve, um, I basically was coming up with like a, a, a hierarchy, right? So what is the nutritional aspect that will have the, the highest overall impact on the athlete's performance, health, and well-being? Mm-hmm. And, and in that case, it was just calorie intake, right? Mm-hmm. So the, the other extreme, basically, she was under eating easily a thousand calories a day. And then for all those who've worked with athletes, especially those uh, that are sort of in the um, yeah endurance sports, the female athletes, sort of, or the athletes that where power to weight ratio matters or weight making, these athletes are very concerned about their body weight mm-hmm. because they it it does have um, an impact on their performance, and they oftentimes they have been under eating for many many years, so for themselves, it it seems the right thing to do. And if you tell them, okay, here's the new diet plan, you need to ramp up your calories by 1,500 calories, there's no freaking way that they are going to do that. Yeah. Um, it's, just, it's, <laughs> it's just so unusual for them. So uh, basically, once I figured out what the, the theoretical problem is, I sort of create um, a roadmap of how to implement the solution in the actual diet. So in that case, um, it was, first of all, I was starting to educate the athlete about the negative effect that she is starting to aware that she's not doing herself a favor and Mm -hmm. um, i'm always trying to catch the athlete by um by emphasizing the performance aspect because some just don't really care at the high level about their health i mean it's it's quite unfortunate but it 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 does happen so Mm -hmm. i tell them okay if you if you keep eating this way your risk of um bone fracture or you're losing your period uh, it doesn't really matter too much to them um mm-hmm. and, and if you say okay well your testosterone is going to drop significantly your uh, immune system and your recovery is going to, to go like way down um mm-hmm. okay that that is um then maybe something that they they buy into and um, and what i then did and usually do is okay let's see um 
what happens if we increase your calorie intake to 300 calories, okay? And then let's see what happens if you feel a little bit better, no? okay? We can maybe take the next step. And surprise, surprise, when you do that, they actually do feel better. And they mm -hmm. come back to you, I had no idea. I've never felt so good in my doing my work. I was like, you have no idea. We've just started, right? Yeah, and yeah. Because and the, the scale is, hasn't changed. Yeah, no, actually, it, it usually um, the, the, the lean body mass increases oh, that, so yeah. quickly because they are yeah. building. Now you're providing the, 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 the energy and the, the protein to actually uh, build muscle mass. And, and before you were like in a catabolic state, like 24 seven, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Um, so what usually happens, basically coming back to the energy in energy out equation is when someone's under eating for a long period of time, and you increase the calorie intake automatically, they're increasing the calorie expenditure as well. So oftentimes mm -hmm. you don't, like you said, you don't see a difference on the scale because yeah. um, the muscles are now being able to, uh, they're, they're being given more energy so that they can produce more force and therefore expend more energy again, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, basically um, I, I always try to, um, I mean, there are a few few boxes when it comes to an athlete's diet that just need to be checked. Um, obviously, it's energy intake, it's hydration, it's micronutrient intake. I mean, those always matter. And um, the, the energy requirement obviously varies from person to person and sport to sport. And even within a sport or a person, it can ch change like drastically from depending on the training volume, basically what sort of period in your in your training cycle you're in mm -hmm. um but other than that it really comes down to um what does your current nutrition look like what is your overall goal which obviously is this can be different from person a to b mm -hmm. um and then what's the time frame right time frame to achieve your goal and then time time frame for for the coaching as well so if um, I only offer long-term coaching, meaning three months plus, um, and that has a reason, and that's because I believe implementing behavior change requires time, right? I'm not a big fan of just writing nutrition plans. Yeah, it can be done, but like I said with the, with the female athlete that was under eating drastically, if I would have given her a diet plan um, that said, okay, you, you need to increase your energy intake by 1500 calories there's no way she would have done that so we mm -hmm. need to transition from where she's at at the moment to where we want to get her and it takes a lot more than just writing nutrition plans like oftentimes it's it's a lot of psychology that's going on and then and, and takes good coaching and um people skills right you need to buy in the athlete um and you need to convince the the athlete you're working with that what you're doing is is going to work and mm -hmm. is um in the end helping their performance and and and, and well-being in the end yeah it takes time to modify behavior and that's really the goal it's not just you know changing one thing one time and then seeing an outcome like it's it's these steps that you've got to build on and that take lots of time weeks months before, before you're able to see the actual uh, effects of all those changes, I think yeah. that's exactly right. Yeah, I don't, I don't like doing any short-term coaching either yeah. when it comes to I mean, nutrition. Uh, one analogy that I always use is comparing nutrition to um, training. Right, mm -hmm. so you need mm -hmm. to have a good, you need to have good fundamentals strength, agility, whatever your focus in, in sports is, but it takes time. It does take time. I mean, building up strength and um, like elite speed, it just doesn't happen because of you're changing uh, your training program for a week, right? That's not going to, to make any difference within one week whatsoever. Mm -hmm. same, same with diet. I mean, uh, until it, it carries over into meaningful differences, it, like like we said, it, it it's a, a patience game. It is, it is. You got to be willing to put the work in, and it's uh, it's not going to happen overnight. Yeah. So, you mentioned uh, earlier a little bit about in your first example about um, the CrossFit athlete and 
uh, the potential for if you're on a paleo diet, you know, to to come in perhaps low on on carbs, which could then affect your total uh, energy intake. So, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what you think of low carbohydrate diets for athletes? Sure, um, very interesting topic. Um, I love it, and that's not because um, I, I'm pro carb or I'm against carb. I, I'm I'm just I'm basically pro evidence, right? I'm I'm um, sharing what I believe is going to benefit my athletes the most, and I don't I don't freaking care if they eat carbs or fat. But, you know, I want them to perform at the best. Um, so, I mean, I've researched this topic um, like in so much detail, and mm -hmm. and it's very interesting because if you actually look at the evidence, it's so clear, right? So, uh, it, it, there is basically no evidence whatsoever that ketogenic diets um, translate into enhanced performance. Zero. It's it's, it's mind-blowing and that it, it's still promoted to be this um, magic bullet. Um, mm -hmm. So here are a few things that do happen when you switch to a low-carbohydrate diet, right? So what is true is um, basically your metabolism is, um, is shift away from carbs towards fat. So you, we do see an enhanced um, fatty ox um, uh, fat oxidation. We do in, mm -hmm. in increased, we do see increased enzyme concentrations, key enzymes for fatty acid metabolism. And um, what's also true is we do see um, an, an, an enhanced mitochondrial biogenesis. So basically uh, just more um, mitochondria and more dense mitochondria where the uh, aerobic metabolism um, is happening. Um, and, and that's all true, but that's all mechanistically. Um, so the question is, does that translate into um, enhanced performance? And the answer to that is no, it does not. And um, I mean, it's not just about low carbohydrate diets. So because we do see an improved aerobic metabolism, researched uh, researchers haven't just dismissed the idea of, okay, this uh, low carb thing doesn't work. They were actually trying or testing a few different versions of mixing uh, low carb and, and, and uh, refueling strategies to see whether, you know, we can have the, the good of both sides, you know, the mm -hmm. uh, in, enhanced fat metabolism. And then, okay, when we need high intensity, uh, can we switch back to the, the carbohydrate, uh, carbohydrate um, side of fueling again. Um, so mm -hmm. besides the uh, long-term chronic low-carb diets, which it really don't work, um, they tried low-carb low -carb diets with um, like refit days right before mm -hmm. um, race stimulation, uh, simulation. Mm -hmm. um, and they also tried um, low-carbohydrate diets with uh, carb intake during prolonged endurance exercise. Um, and basically what was being observed is that apparently, because the athletes have been on a low carb diet for so long, um, it's not enough time to, for the carbohydrate metabolism to become efficient, to work efficiently again. So, mm -hmm. um, even though they have reintroduced carbs, the body is still not able to work with the carbs or produce ATP from carbohydrates as efficiently as it can be and um not surprisingly it, it overall doesn't translate over to um enhanced performance um there are uh, one two three studies that didn't find uh negative side effects or or, or uh, a dampened performance mm -hmm. but that's not the same as enhanced performance okay right <laughs> so just to make that clear just because you don't see a, a decrement on performance it doesn't mean it it, it, improves it improves performs, it. yeah. Exactly. So it, basically, there's, I think, one or two studies that found like actually or reported um, performance benefits, um, and one study is, is like very old from the 80s, like from Finn. Yeah. Um, are we still I on? I, I lost you for a second there. Yeah. But so we'll, what was that one study from the 80s? Yeah. So. That was basically run by one of the first low carb gurus, Finney. I think it was like an 83 paper. It's really funny to read because the participants are actually um, named by their actual name. Wow. 
Yeah, nice. <laughs> that was really cool. Um, <laughs> so that study was run with five participants, right? There was no intervention or placebo group. So it was like a crossover study. So first they were doing like, um, they were put on, I don't know how many weeks for a low carb diet and they were doing this time to exhaustion um, cycle cycling test basically um, and they reported a, a mean improvement um, for performance but if you look actually a little deeper in the study and you look at the ind individual data points what was happening is you had like one potentially two um, outliers that completely over responded to the low carb high fat diet for whatever reason like mm. they're uh, i don't know for me, there's no rationale why that happens. Maybe something in their lifestyle because um, it, it just wouldn't really make sense. But because it was only five people and you had that one outlier in the in, in the performance measurement, it basically um, changed or had a drastic effect of the mean values of the studies that that were reported, right? And then, maybe they started supplementing with HMB. Uh, yeah, who knows? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> maybe it started all in the eighties. <laughs> Yeah, um, so if you actually look at the numbers, uh, two out of the five um, athletes actually performed worse on the ketogenic mm -hmm. diet. Um, but uh, one was roughly the same and then one like hugely improved their performance for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, it's just another example of, of how study reporting can be manipulated. And, and basically, um, even though um, the, the study itself is not manipulated, but because of, um, let's say, questionable reporting, it, it can make the impression that low carb is superior to, to a high carb um, diet. I um, think that's, that's an instance where statistical significance doesn't equate to practical significance. Like, yeah. even if the data shows maybe it's better, well, like, yeah, you, you've got five subjects, and like you said, two of them, performed way worse and then so it's with five subjects that's a wash like yeah. i mean what do you what do you do there like i mean that that uh, to be fair i mean five five subjects and, and just having basically one a study group or intervention group is uh is a terrible study yeah <laughs> but you, 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 you need to start somewhere and to be fair it was in the in the 80s and um, sure. they probably had zero funding so um mm. um no direct criticism to, to the author. It was probably just what it was back in the 80s, right? For sure. Um, but um, I think you mentioned something very important there because um, studies or researchers do start to report in individual data points in their studies and then not just mean values. And that makes it really interesting to see because, uh, especially in sports science, because um, participant numbers are usually quite low. So 10 to 15 per group is usually what we see. And um, when they do report the individual responses and changes um, with regards to body composition and performance, you usually see um, responders and non-responders and basically to, to any intervention. And that's really interesting because what does that tell us? Um, so when, when I say, okay, the majority of studies and the majority of athletes, they don't respond to low carb diets well. They might still be, I'm, and I'm just throwing out random numbers, right? Um, mm -hmm. There might still be one out of 10 that does really well on a low carb diet. And mm -hmm. I would never dismiss that. Um, it's just when you work with athletes, you obviously want to start off with what's working for the majority. Mm -hmm. And that's definitely not low carb. Um, yeah. yeah, so that's that's basically my take on, on low carb. I suppose we can, um, if you're interested, we can touch on sort of the train low, compete high. Um, nutritional strategies as well, where sort of yeah. um, periodized low carb availability is implemented mm -hmm. in the training. Is, is that something your audience would be interested as well? I think so. I think yeah. very much so. Yeah. Yeah. So, so basically, um, I mean, research, researchers aren't dumb and they basically want the same as we, we, they want to find out what's, what's working for the athletes. And, um, they started in the, um, mid two thousands. And there are a few more mechanistical studies that um, that found that, okay, you, when you do certain types of training with low glycogen availability, and we're talking mainly muscle glycogen, not liver glycogen, mm -hmm. um, you do see 
what has been uh, observed and reported with chronic low carbohydrate diets. Um, so enhanced fat metabolism, enhanced mitochondrial biogenesis, um, which potentially can can lead to increased um, aerobic metabolism and performance. But instead of going low carb chronically, um, they came up with the strategy of sort of switching back and forth between low carb and high carb and mm-hmm. um, pe- pe- periodizing a certain amount of training sessions where your, your glycogen levels are depleted. Mm-hmm. And those training sessions are usually done um, with low intensity because for high intensity, we definitely do need the, the carbs the, to uh, turn on the anaerobic glycolytic system. Mm-hmm. Um, and by that, we can basically, um, yeah, take uh, the goods from both worlds, right? So mm-hmm. we, we can uh, maybe improve our fat, fat metabolism a little bit further than just eating high carbs all the time. But when it comes to like a high intensity carbohydrate session, uh, high, sorry, a high intensity uh, training session, you want to make sure that you've eaten plenty of carbs before and um, replenish your glycogen stores. Um, and there are a few ways to accomplish that. So it's not just going low carb, but you actually need to work your muscles to deplete your muscle glycogen. Um, and even before that research was out there, athletes, especially endurance athletes, they were basically doing that already. So sometimes mm-hmm. athletes are ahead of research and then research is catching up and basically reporting what's going on, right, in the body. Yeah. It's quite oh, yeah. interesting. <laughs> um, so, so one scenario that, that um, would basically be an example of, of training with low glycogen availability is just doing prolonged uh, like really long endurance rides or running or whatever and not fueling with carbohydrates and by long i mean anything over 90 minutes um that would basically deplete like a decent uh, a decent intensity so it it wouldn't be like okay um it's not sort of the i'm out of breath intensity like i'm, mm-hmm. I'm hitting it 100 percent, but it, it, it's not like a complete recovery session right so somewhat in 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 the middle mm-hmm. um and then after 90 minutes, roughly, your muscle glycogen will be depleted. And, and after that, the, um, on, on a cellular level, a certain, um, certain pathways are switched on, um, mm-hmm. mainly by the low glycogen availability. So that basically starts with um, a substance or an enzyme called AMPK. Mm-hmm. Um, and then that basically triggers uh, sort of the, the master switch for the uh, aerobic, uh, aerobic metabolism, uh, not metabolism, but the basically what, what regulates um, mitochondrial biogenesis, which is called B, uh, PGCA alpha. Um, and, and that basically just gets more emphasis than with high carbohydrate availability. So um, you would just keep riding or trading for another hour or two, right? And having during this period, you basically get enhanced adaptations for the fat metabolism. Um, And then right after, you would refuel with carbohydrates to make sure maybe in the evening or the next day, you would be uh, able to train with uh, replenished glycogen stores to, you know, basically do a high intensity session. Another scenario would be, okay, I do... um, a high intensity training session in the morning, um, basically just 90 minutes, 60 minutes, intervals, whatever, just to, to you know, deplete your glycogen um, as, as, as far as possible. And then mm-hmm. you refrain from, from any carbohydrates after. So you just, you know, have a protein shake, some salmon, maybe some veggies, so carbs and fats. And then you soon after do another um, low intensity training session, maybe in the afternoon, just four or five hours later. So mm-hmm. by by that, you make sure the second session is done in a low muscle glycogen um, state, basically. Um, and a third, probably the most extreme version, is um, what's called sleep low. So you basically do the high intensity session in the evening, and then you're sl- sleeping with low glycogen availability, basically making the the period of um, for for cellular adaptation, you're just expanding that, right? So from one to three hours to seven to ten hours, anything in between, and then mm-hmm. they usually do another faster training session in the morning. So that's 
probably wow. the, the the most extreme combination. Um, and it does work. We have studies proving that it is um, not just superior to chronic low carb diets, but actually superior to chronic high carb diets as well. Hmm. Um, and the, the the research at the moment is, is pretty promising. So the last time I've looked deeper into all the studies that are available, that was uh, this summer, so not too far long. Um, hmm. And there were nine studies um, out there um, sort of assessing uh, real or, or where yeah, they were basically mimicking like real world high intensity training sessions or even competitions, right? So it wasn't just leg extensions or some sort of uh, pseudo workout. In right? the lab. So, in yeah. The yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, and most of the studies were actually done with like elite athletes. So, which is quite interesting and rare, a rare thing um, to, to have. Mm -hmm. And um, from the nine studies, I think um, I'm, I'm, I'm positive, like one um, actually reported a uh, negative uh, effect so actually the, the performance um, decreased for whatever for whatever reason but mm. in four studies the performance increased but to the same extent in comparison to the high carb groups mm -hmm. and in the remaining four studies the reported performance changes was actually superior to high, the high carb um, group so basically the athletes um, were able to uh, enhance both their aerobic and anaerobic system at the same time um, which is pretty cool and um, i think this is definitely where what science should be doing it shouldn't be dismissing um you know certain strategies before um extensively researching whether there are any benefits and we can tweak things around and, and make um the best out of it mm -hmm. and um i think there's a reason why many endurance athletes have been doing faster training for many 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 years um and basically that just is proof of proof of concept right um i think mm -hmm. it's just that maybe and that's just my experience and i don't know what what your experience is but um many endurance athletes they they usually just do faster training in the morning and that is not the same as doing training sessions with completely depleted muscle glycogen because overnight we basically the liver glycogen um, is reduced by let's say 50 to 60 percent mm -hmm. and um, there's some some of the things that are just explained on a cellular level um, are being triggered by um, lowered liver glycogen as well but it really depends on the muscle glycogen and you need to deplete your 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 carbs in the muscles, your, your glycogen source first to really benefit from that um, uh, from that method. Mm -hmm. I think the uh, at the end of the day, um, kind of like like you said earlier, starting out with an athlete, or if an athlete's listening, or if there's a coach out there who's you know wondering whether they should switch all of their athletes to uh, to being fat adapted, like. So I, I work quite a bit within the, uh, the endurance running and triathlon community here in Dallas. And within the past two to three years, uh, let's say five years, within the past five years, there's been a huge shift to especially Ironman level triathlons. A lot of coaches are pressuring their athletes to go low carb, to go what they call fat adapted or ketogenic. The main reason is because if you are not dependent on refueling with carbohydrate during the race, then there's less chance of GI issues during your race. And I think uh, if, you're, if your goal is just to finish an Ironman, then that's probably okay. Agreed. If, if your goal yeah. is to compete at the highest level that you can possible, then you're probably going to want some carbs. <laughs> yeah. Uh, again, so. I, I completely agree. Um, I mean, a few thoughts that I want to share um, when it comes to Ironman performance and, and, and nutritional strategies and in particular carbohydrate intake. Um, so first of all, um, are you aware of any like elite performing Ironman athletes that are like restraining from carbs completely? I don't. 
I don't know of any, no. Yeah, yeah. Um, they're probably like on the sub-lead level. Um, I'm sure there are a few, but mm -hmm. it's just one example. I mean, it's it's just observational data, obviously, right? So yeah. um, right. you need to be careful and put that into context. But Jan Frodino, he's eating his carbs, mm -hmm. right? Um, Lionel Sanders is eating his carbs. Uh, GI issues is definitely a big thing, uh, in particular in, in, in like those super long endurance events and when they try to really ramp up their carbohydrate intake. Um, but that can be, uh, the, the tolerance of that can be trained as well. So it's called sort of gate, uh, training the gut. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not just a, a thing made up. So we do have uh, data that shows um, we can definitely, the, the, the more carbs that you, that you consume, um, that you actually increase the, the protein carriers in the gut absorbing the carbohydrates. So um, it, there, there is a reason why you should like slowly ramp up your carbs and not just go from 30 grams an hour to 90. And then there's mm. probably a personal tolerance of the amount that you, you can tolerate. And that's probably mainly genetically, to be honest. Um, yeah. And then some especially amateurs, they just, they're taking in the, the wrong supplements, the wrong type of carbohydrates as well. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, those are just my thoughts. Like you basically said, it's, it's a good summary. If you just want to finish the Ironman, yeah, you, you'll probably get away with um, a low carbohydrate diet. Mm -hmm. um, I'm aware of, of, of one, um, it's not an elite am, Ironman, but he's, he's, pretty pretty damn good like nine hours and less mm -hmm. so um it's, it's pretty good yeah sub sub elite level and um uh, he's eating basically uh a, a, or following a ketogenic diet and then during an iron man he's roughly taking in like 40 grams of carbs per hour and it seems to be working fine for him um mm -hmm. the question that remains and we can only speculate would he perform better with a higher carbohydrate diet and yeah, we can't clone him, right? So we 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 can only speculate what would can happen. Can only speculate. Yeah. Yeah. Um. And in the end, it, it I think this is an, a decision that should be made by the athlete um, after he has been objectively informed about potential pros and cons. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm not a big fan um, of coaches, in particular when they're not educated in nutrition pressuring the athletes to do whatever. It doesn't mean if it's low right. carb, high fat, vegan, or um, if you're not an expert in, in that area, just, you know, refer to someone else. Mm -hmm. I'm not giving my athletes massages. <laughs> I'm not pretending to be a doctor. And even mm -hmm. if it comes to certain nutritional issues, I'm referred to an expert in that field, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. Got to know your lane and you got to know when... Uh, when your job hits a hits a wall, you shouldn't try to push through that wall. Sometimes you gotta refer out. There's yeah. definitely times where, like everybody wins when you do that. Like the athlete will trust you more because they understand that you have their best interests in mind, and then they actually get the help that they need. Um, so it's that's one of those things. There's there's definitely a lot of people out there who don't like to. They want to do everything. They want to cover all the bases. There was a time where that's I thought I wanted to do that. So you know, I wanted to I wanted to coach uh, track and field athletes, and I also wanted to be the strength coach, and I also wanted to be the nutrition coach, and I also wanted to study sports psychology so I could address any you know mental barriers. And then uh, you know I took some some classes that related to other variables and other aspects because I wanted to be able to to cover everything. And then you end up being a mile wide but an inch deep. And there's just there's no foundation there. So you gotta know what you're good at and definitely address the issues that are within yeah, that I lane. I mean you you can't really become an expert in everything. Right? You can't. <laughs> it's That's just true. not possible. Um yeah. I would love to do what you just described. I mean, in theory, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the dream job, right? Yes. Um, there would be so many pros in terms of, okay, you wouldn't have to, uh, you know, catch up with a strength and conditioning coach and what their programming is and in order to match the diet plan to 
the demands of the training. You could just, you know, yeah. all do it yourself, but um, yeah. it's just in the end, the day only has 24 hours and that's, um, it's not enough to be, to become an expert in everything. That's so true. Unfortunately, yeah. That's so true. Yeah. Well, Jay, we've been going for about an hour and 10 minutes if the time flies by. Um, I, we did have some other questions to cover, but I think we're just going to have to do another episode so we can talk about uh, some of your favorite supplements and some of the, some of the specific ingredients that, um, that you recommend. So we'll have to save that for down the road because uh, I'd love to have you back on, man. Ah, cool. Absolutely. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, really, really enjoy chatting nutrition anytime, really. So uh, yes. it would be a pleasure to be back on. Sweet. So uh, let everybody know how they can follow you, how they can reach out to you if they've got questions, all of that sort of thing. Yeah, sure. So um, probably the best uh, platform to reach out is, is Instagram, really. Um, so my uh, handle is uh, athlete coach, and uh, it's a little um, word game here. So it's not athlete, L E T E, like uh, uh, someone who's working out. So um, it's athlete with L E A T, like the word eat. So that yes. basically is just um, to make sure um, that, yeah, I'm not just uh, a strength and conditioning coach, but I'm actually a nutritionist. Um, yes. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm currently working. So I just moved back to the UK recently again. So my website is um, just uh, being, it's, it's in the progress to be to be online in English as well. So um, then basically my website uh, will be again, athletecoach.com. Um, I'm also on Facebook um, and, and LinkedIn, et cetera, but I'm not too active on those platforms. So um, Instagram is probably best. And if you mm -hmm. have a personal question, you can al always send me an email at mail at athletecoach.com. Um, and then, yeah, send in any questions that you have, um, either regarding the topics that we have discussed this episode or anything that you want me to address. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we've uh, wanted to cover supplements uh, in, a, in a broader range um so sort of what works what doesn't uh, and uh, what for what sort of athlete um so we'll dive into that i suppose during the next uh, episode i'm excited to do that yes me too i can't wait man this has been great thank you so much for taking the time to do this um enjoy the rest of uh of your friday and yeah uh, yeah my pleasure will... my pleasure sweet um, well, we will have you on very soon Hopefully. Cool. Looking forward to it. Awesome. Awesome. Alrighty, all. Thanks for watching and listening. Stay tuned for next week's episode. Adios.